<laughs> okay, guys, should we start? Good. So we are at the last lecture together, and the purpose of today's lecture is to basically introduce the projects for these uh, hands-on uh, tutorials. Um, but before doing that, I would like to advertise this activity, which is a hackathon about the Internet of Things, which is organized by Politecnico. So um, basically, <coughs> it's going to be at the end of the month, uh, Friday 27 and Saturday 28 of May in the Bovisa campus, okay, not here, but at the other campus of Politecnico. So um, it's, uh, you have to enroll for this, okay, so it's for, uh, there's a limited number of available um, positions there, okay, and um, basically <coughs> you will work with this hardware here, let me see. Um, <clears throat> so you will you will work with Node MCU hardware, which is a very very cheap and low cost um, sensor based on the ESP8266 platform, which is basically a, a Wi-Fi pl uh, platform. Okay. So it's this little thing here, and it's basically uh, comparable to what we have seen in terms of uh, um, uh, resources, okay? So limited memory, limited uh, uh, processing. It has a radio chip, which is not 8.2.15.4, it's 8.2.11, so it's standard Wi-Fi. But still, you can attach it to sensors, and you can uh, use it to you know, develop little prototypes for the Internet of Things. Uh, it's based on Lua, okay, which is an uh, Arduino-based uh, um, uh, software language. It's very, very simple, okay, so don't be scared. If you are interested to this kind of activities and uh, you want to know a little bit more, I mean, you can try to enroll and go there. It, I, I think it... Uh, it will be interesting. I would go myself, but unfortunately I can't, okay? So basically, I can't on that days. Um, you can go on the Polyfactory website and see whether you are interested or not. And maybe you can then let me know if, um, if you go there how it was, basically. Uh, you, I guess you should have received an email about this, probably at least. Okay, so coming to the projects. <clears throat> so probably you have already uh, read the project proposals on the website, so I mean what I'm going to talk about today is probably not completely new to you, but I mean just to have you on the same page I will explain again the requirements for the projects, how, how the projects are evaluated, so on and so forth, deadlines. And then for each one of the projects, I will explain a little bit into the details what the project is about. And if you have questions, of course, feel free to ask, okay? So we may, we may clarify a little bit what are the requirements. Um, also, I, I would like to stress that Apart from these three projects that are online, you may come and propose a project of your choice, okay? Some students have already done this, okay? Someone is working on a thesis and would like uh, to join the, the thesis project with the course project, which is okay, it's feasible. Uh, the only thing that I ask you is just tell me, okay? So I can, let's say, tune the requirements for the projects uh, and basically equalize the requirements to, to, to what I'm asking for the other projects, okay? So you don't overwork or underwork, basically. Okay, good. So, 
Let's start with some general rules about these uh, projects and how I intend them. First of all, grading, okay? If with the written exam, you can reach up to 26 uh, over 30 points, okay? Which are assigned based on uh, how well you solve the problems during the written exam, okay? So the uh, rest of the points, in order to reach full uh, grade, can be uh, gained with a project, okay? So up to eight alpha, so it's parametric to alpha, we will see what this alpha is in a, in a while. So up to eight alpha <coughs> points are assigned based on the project, okay? Depending on the project that, that you choose, on how well you do the project and uh, on basically the, the timing okay, of this project. So how long does it take for you to, to deliver the project? So basically this alpha here, which is a multiplier, okay, actually a divider. So if you deliver your project before September 22, okay, alpha is gonna be equal to one, okay? Meaning that you can get the full project points, okay? After September 22, but before February 28, alpha is gonna be 0 0.5, okay? So the maximum you can take for a project is, is basically the maximum project points divided by two if you deliver the project between September 22 and February 28, okay? After February 28, alpha is gonna be zero, so I mean, no points, okay? I mean, September 22 is in uh, four months, maybe a little bit more. So there's plenty of time, okay? Um, anyway, you have still time after the September appellos in order to deliver your project, depending on what you want. Now, what you should use in order to solve the project, well, this is up to you, basically, although what I strongly suggest is to use TinyOS because when I uh, wrote the project, I had in mind basically a resolution with TinyOS. But in principle, they, uh, they can be solved with Motrunner and Contiki as well, okay? So I don't put any strong uh, constraint on the operating system that you use in order to develop the projects. Um, if you use TinyOS, your life is gonna be simpler, basically, okay? But, I mean, you can choose whatever you want. Now, what you have to deliver is basically, so when you finish your project, or at least when you think your project is finished, which may be different, uh, you have to send me an email, okay, with the complete source code, that you can make an archive and put the source code inside, uh, a self-explanatory uh, log file, so which basically can be the output of your simulator, okay? So the set of debug statements that you include in your code, or the printf that you include in your Contiki code, and so on and so forth. Uh, the purpose of this log file is uh, for me to read it, and just by reading what are the debug statements that you output from your project, understanding that your project works, basically, okay? So it's gonna be a self-explanatory log file. Of course, try to be as detailed as possible, okay, when you produce this. I have to understand that you basically uh, covered all possible, let's say, possibilities in your code, that your code is indeed respecting the requirements, and so on and so forth. Of course, if, if you write your, your code in a proper way, then this log file should be automatically generated. So if you, if you properly uh, design and implement your project, then you, you will have basically no need to spend time on this log file, okay? Because it's the thing that you use in order to understand that your project works, basically. Um, so the source code, the log file, and then a project report, maximum two, three pages, where you basically write what is the project that you uh, solved, how you approached the solution of the project, 
uh, what kind of problems did you encounter, you include maybe some figure if needed, okay, so on and so forth. Don't include the source code in the report because I will not read it, okay? So just a very, very short report uh, explaining, uh, summarizing uh, what you did and I don't know, putting maybe a figure or two of your uh, topology that you tested or some, you know, building blocks of your uh, system, so on and so forth. Okay, before I go on, any questions on the uh, rules, grading, what you have to deliver? Perfectly clear. Good. Okay. Of course, you can send me an email if at some point you understand that some information was missing, okay? <clears throat> okay, good. So the first project is the smart bracelet, which uh, will give you up to eight points, okay? So if you do it in, in a proper way, and you deliver it before uh, uh, September 22, then you can gain maximum eight points, okay? So what's the project about? So we have seen, if I remember correctly, during one of our uh, first lectures, that um, there are some commercially available products are out there, which are basically uh, wireless bracelets, okay? That if you have uh, a, a child or some children, you can basically make them uh, work. And the, the purpose of this bracelet basically is to create a link between a parent and his child, basically, okay? So you can get information, real-time information on um, what your, your baby is doing, if it's okay, if it's uh, standing, walking, if, if it's falling down, where he is, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the idea here is to prototype a very, very lightweight uh, system which emulates uh, one of these uh, smart bracelets pair, okay? What's that? <laughs> well, this is probably someone spying on us. So the bracelet is meant to be worn by both a child and her or his parent and the main functionality is to keep track of the child's position, okay, where he is in terms of coordinates, like a GPS, something like this, and trigger alerts when a child goes too far, okay, from the parent or maybe when the child is in a condition which is may, may, may be dangerous, okay. For example, the, the, the child has... Uh, fallen down or something like this. So the idea is that uh, what you have to do is to implement such a system, okay? So you have a pair of, bra of bracelets, one for the parent and the other one for... <laughs> okay, there's uh, an interference with the... I, I can't... I can't do anything. <laughs> I guess, I guess we are stuck with this interference, but anyway. <laughs> that, that's uh, hilarious, actually. <laughs> oh, wait, no, I can't. Okay, so um, the idea is to have, first of all, a pairing phase, okay? So the idea is that maybe you take your, your, um, your children to the kindergarten or to the park, so there will be a lot of children, a lot of parents, they may have these bracelets as well, okay? So the first thing you have to be sure is that your bracelet is paired with your children's bracelet, okay? And how can you do this? Well, the easiest way to do this is to imagine that there's a preloaded uh, key 
on the uh, bracelet pair, and this is a unique uh, key, okay? So you can perform some sort of pairing by exchanging these keys, okay? So the idea is that we have a 20 characters key, so a string composed of 20 characters, which may be randomly generated, and that is preloaded on the pair, okay? So, so when you buy this pair, this key is already preloaded on the bracelets. And in order to perform the pairing, what you can do is basically broadcast this key, okay? So transmit a message, a particular message that contains the key, and upon reception of a random key, you basically check that the key you have received is equal to the key you have stored in your memory, okay? So if it's the case, then you understand that the source node that transmitted the key that matches with your is your pairing device, okay? So by doing this, you can, for example, store the address of the transmitter node and perform a pairing in such a way, okay? So for example, the idea is that you have several nodes, okay, in, in communication range. Each of these nodes uh, broadcasts a key. This is um, a three-character uh, key, but uh, I mean, the requirement is to make a 20 characters uh, key. For example, the blue node here tr uh, broadcasts the ABC key. And when the red node receives the ABC key, it checks the, the key against its own key, which is DEF. And of course, these two keys are different, so there won't be a pairing between these two. When this node here receives the ABC key, it checks the key with its own, there's a match, so the address of this node will be stored here, okay? And there will be a pairing be between these two. Very, very simple. Now, whenever you have found your, your pairing device, what you can do is basically to transmit a message in Unicast back to the source of the matching key, okay? And this message, the, the purpose of this message is to stop this discovery phase, okay? Because it means that you have found your pairing device and from the reception of this message on, you start the operation of the bracelet pair, okay? So you need to create a particular message type which stops this uh, uh, keying, uh, broadcast of the keys and uh, basically puts the, the bracelet pair in the operation mode. Yes? Yes. Exactly. You may imagine that the, the, the factory that produces this bracelet produce, produces couples of bracelets. So when you buy uh, the product, you buy a couple of them. It, it can be only by one, it can be by both of them, okay? So you are, I mean, I'm not putting constraints on the protocol details here, okay? Choose the solution that you think it's better, and of course, write the solution that you have taken in the project report, okay? That's the purpose of the project report. <clears throat> okay, so once the pairing is performed, so you have basically a couple of transmitter and receiver, the, the parent's bracelet basically uh, listen for incoming messages from the, the child's bracelet, okay? And of course, only messages coming from the, uh, the, 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 your child's bracelet should be accepted, of course. Um, and these information messages are transmitted periodically by the child's bracelet, okay? For example, you can imagine that these messages are transmitted every 10 seconds, okay? Again, it's not a, uh, a strict constraint. You can make one second, five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever you wish. Um, and each information message which is transmitted from the child's bracelet to the parent's bracelet should contain the position of a child, so a pair of coordinates, basically, x, y, or latitude, longitude, whatever you wish. And these could be random numbers, okay? I mean, it, 
it just to put some some numbers inside so this could be totally random numbers choose the distribution you want uniform Gaussian whatever you wish okay so you know, so you have the child position and the child status okay where the child status is basically uh, an information of the uh, kinematic status of, of the, the baby and could be one of these four uh, labels standing walking running or falling okay so one information message could look like this okay so you have uh, here sorry you have some field to identify that this is an information message you have x and y which could be random numbers and then you have the information on the status of the children okay now how to choose which status to include in the message? Well, we'll see in a while. Okay, I don't. Yeah, I was sure I had inserted this. Um, let me check. So. So while x, y are random numbers. Um, the way you select which status to insert the message should be performed in such a way that the probability of walking, running and falling in, is 0 0.3. So 3 times out of 10 basically you can get either walking, running or falling and only, sorry, standing, walking and running and only 1 time out of 10 times the classification should be folded, okay? So this should be the probability distribution of the status of a child that you inside that you put inside a message. Okay. <clears throat> Oops. Now what happens on the uh, parents bracelet? So you listen for these uh, incoming messages, and if the content of the, an info message is falling, of course you, you have to do something, okay? For example, what you can do is to send, okay, a fall alarm reporting the position of the children, okay? Now, there's no specific information on how this uh, sending may be done, for example, it may just be a debug statement saying, okay, the, the, the children is falling and the last position seen was this one, okay? Of course, what can happen is, is that uh, if the parent bracelet does not receive any message from the children bracelet, it means that, for example, um, the, the child has gone too far. Okay, so it's no more in communication range and no more messages could be received. So for example, after one minute from the last uh, received message from your coupling bracelet, the parent's bracelet should uh, raise a missing alarm, okay? Reporting the last position received, okay, from the, from the child. It means that you have to, of course, keep in memory what is the last position received. So the requirements are, are the following. So uh, implement the, the prototype according to these uh, requirements. And if you just deliver this, okay, the source code, of course with the log file and so on and so forth, you will get 50%. Okay, so maximum four points. Then if you, if you simulate the implementation with two couple of bracelets, okay, so at least uh, two couples, okay, not just one, you can uh, get up to 75%, that is six points, basically. Of course, you should show that everything works, so the pairing is correct, even in presence of multiple uh, couples of bracelet. And, for example, in, if you use uh, TOSIM to simulate, you can simulate that a node goes out of the range by calling the mode turn off. Um, command on a particular mode which basically turns off a mode okay in Contiki you can just move um, a mode 
out of the range of the receiver one in order to simulate that uh, one of the two modes has gone too far, basically. Okay. So what you can do is to, you know, turn off a mode in Tosim or move it away in con in Kuja, okay. And by doing this, you should see a missing alarm, okay. Finally, if you attach your simulation to Tosim Live or Node-RED, okay, as we have seen during the lectures, and you uh, somehow intercept the alarm messages sent by the base station, so the, by the parent bracelet in this case, then you can uh, show on the terminal with a Java program that listens to, listens to the, these messages, or in Node-RED, uh, um, and you can show in these dashboards basically the alarm messages which are sent by the parent bracelet. Okay, so the last step in order to get the full eight points is to connect your uh, sensor networks composed of two or four devices to either the TOSIM Live program we have seen or Node Red in order to get the messages which are sent from the parent bracelet. Okay, any question? Is it clear? Okay, so as you can imagine, I mean, the basic building blocks are exactly what we have seen during the lectures, okay? So the only thing that you have to work on is basically the protocol implementation and the logic, which is, you know, kind of easy once you know the, how to, to, to use timers, how to read and send a message, and so on and so forth, okay? So don't be scared. It's gonna be easy. Okay, second project, if you do not have any question, is the distributed nearest neighbor search, okay? So, <clears throat> there are several cases, several applications in a wireless sensor network where you are required to perform uh, queries on a database, okay? And by, uh, I mean, with queries on a database, I mean searching a particular string or vector of numbers inside a database that contains different strings or vectors of number, and then returning what is the index or the label associated to the nearest neighbor in terms of, for example, Euclidean distance, okay? Uh, there are many examples of this general scenario. For example, when you want to perform localization using fingerprints, then that's the case. Or when you want to perform uh, visual analysis such as face or object recognition. Um, so imagine that you have like a sensor network composed of cameras, okay? So each sensor is basically a camera that can acquire images. What happens is that you take an image, for example, an image like this, okay, which, is, which uh, shows a pedestrian here. Then you run an algorithm on the camera node that converts this image into a vector of number, okay, of numbers. So, for example, in this case, this image is converted into a, a small vector with five entries, okay, now, the way this conversion is performed is basically a computer vision algorithm, okay, that transforms the image into a very, very compact signature of the image itself. Now, once you have this compact signature, what you would like to do is to search in a database of signatures which are the most similar signature which basically inform informs you about what object you are looking at, okay? So for example, you can set up an algorithm that if your camera is looking at a particular object, it sends an alarm or it does something, okay? This is generally used in uh, uh, automatic traffic lights. When you have a traffic light on a street and there's a camera on the traffic light and if uh, an ambulance is coming, 
the, tr the, the camera recognizes the, the ambulance and triggers the traffic light to green, okay, so that the ambulance can pass, basically. Um, of course, in order to perform this matching between the signature and the database, and if you are in a sensor network scenario, the camera node has to transmit this signature to a sync node where the complete database is stored, okay? And the database looks like this. So you have several entries, and for each entry you have a label, okay? So it can be, for example, a car, pedestrian, a bike, and so on and so forth. And what you do basically, you compute the Euclidean distance between the query vector that you are, have transmitted and all the entries in the database. Okay? So for example, the Euclidean distance between this and the first entry is 12.449. Between the first and the second entry is 16. Between the first and the third is 3, and so on and so forth. After you have computed all the distances, you pick the entry with the minimum distance, which would, would be the third one in this case. Okay? If you perform Euclid Euclidean distance between this and this, you get 3. This is the smallest distance in your database, so you can say that this query corresponds to a pedestrian because the label associated to this entry in the database is a pedestrian, okay? So that's how generally these tasks are performed. Now what happens is that sometimes you want to move the database from the sync node, from the base station, uh, maybe a little bit closer to the camera nodes, okay? So for example, instead of having the database here, I would like to have the database here, okay? For example. Why would I want to do that? Well, for example, for in order to minimize the delay between the query transmission and the reception of the reply, okay? So I just move closer to where the query is generated, the database. What's the problem? The problem is that sensor nodes, as you know, have limited memory, okay? So it's uh, difficult to move an entire database on each node, okay? It may be too large, and we, we may not have enough memory on the nodes in order to store the database. So generally, the database is divided in chunks, okay? So pieces of the database are basically distributed among different sensor nodes. In this case, we have the ch central database here at the base station, the big triangle here. And for example, the first two entries are moved to this sensor. The third and the fourth entry are moved here. The, uh, the fifth and the sixth are moved here. And the rest are moved here, okay? So we basically disseminate the database in the network and this generally helps in reducing the delay or the latency of uh, transmitting a query and receiving the reply. Of course, now the thing is a little bit different because our query has to travel to all parts of this database in order to you know, find the closest match, right? So, <coughs> Each node which hosts a database chunk, a part of the database, is going to receive the query. Each node will uh, perform this near and neighbor matching, so computing the distances of its entries, and returning to the source node its partial results. Okay? So the label associated to the closest object and the distance associated to that object. The query node receives all labels and distances from all the database nodes and comparing the distances can select which is the minimum one, okay? So instead of performing everything as the central node, we are basically dividing this process in many steps, okay? So the idea is to implement such a scenario. So, um, 
what I ask is to implement distributed nearest neighbor search on a wireless sensor network in which you have two query nodes and four database nodes, okay? So you have, for example, node one and two, which are the query nodes. So they transmit queries. And nodes three, four, five, and six, which hosts chunks of the database. Every uh, node is, is in direct communication with every other node, so it's a simple topology. And each query node, so node one and two, has five 10 dimensional queries to transmit, okay? So a vector with 10 entries, five of these vectors, okay? And each database node has a portion of the database which contains 50 10 dimensional entries. So 50 entries, each one has 10 numbers basically. So the idea is to perform nearest neighbor search. So each query node sends a query to each database node. Again, you can decide if using unicast or broadcast communication, protocol aspects are up to you. And upon reception of a query, a database node has to perform nearest neighbor matching and then uh, has to reply to the query node, informing it to the closest object of the closest object, okay, so the label associated to the closest object and the computed distance. The query node waits for replies from all database nodes and basically once you receive all the replies you can select what is the best label by comparing the distances that you have received and selecting of course the minimum one. What happens if one or, or, or more replies are not received? Well, what you can do is to implement some sort of timeout. If the timeout expires and you haven't still received some of the replies, you can send the query again, okay? So you have to implement possible uh, losses of replies due to interferences or weak links and so on and so forth. Now, how to generate queries and database chunks? Well, I have already prepared for you a tiny OS components in order to create this. You can download the components and there's also an example on how to run it. I will show it to you now. Um, it's uh, meant to be used in such a way that query nodes have ID one and two, as I show in the topology, and database nodes have ID three, four, five, and six, okay? So I can show you an example here. Let's see. It's very fast as usual. So there are, there's an, ar an archive that you can download from the website and uh, it should contain uh, the supporting file directory and there's going to be a distributed database directory. Um, there are a couple of um, components he has to use and there's, I uh, guess this one is the application that uh, shows how to basically um, get the, okay, this is the configuration. So this is gonna be, so this application already shows how to uh, get the data, okay? So you have basically to include this um, file. 
the uh, data slash database.h file, which of course contains all the database chunks and the queries. And you have to use the interface read query on query nodes. Okay. Then uh, here there are on database node you should use this uh, variable, okay, which contains the database chunk. And uh, on query nodes you should use the current query, okay. On database node you should you should also use a vector of labels basically. So for example here what happens um, when you boot if you are node 1 or node 2 it means you are a query node right so you you have to call the query control dot start um, uh, command and the start done basically starts a periodic timer okay each time this timer fires what you do is basically you read a query okay so in order to do this you just call the read query is um, array as a parameter and the query will be copied inside this array so what I'm doing here I'm uh, printing this query to to the screen okay so we can also try to run it in TOSIM in this case um, just if, if you open this TOSIM file just change what node you want to create okay so if you create node 1 in this case it will be a query node if you create no, node 3 it will be a database node so let's see what happens if I run this for uh, a node 1 let me open the terminal Um, okay, let me compile it for simulation. Let me run it. Okay, so as you can see, each time the timer fired, we got basically a new query, okay? And a query for us is just a vector of 10 entries, okay? So you can start from this example to get queries on a query node. And instead, let's see what happens if you are not a query node but if you are a database node so here so if you are not a query node you will get inside this else statement and depending on the ID that you have basically you will load a particular chunk of the database okay and this data1, data2 and so on are contained in the header file that you include at the beginning so, <clears throat> for example, if I run the simulation putting node 3 here, okay, uh, now the output is different because node 3 is a database node, um, and I'm just showing what is the first entry in the chunk of the database, okay? And of course, if you change the node, it, it will also change the entries. Okay. <clears throat> now all this data is in a header file, so if you decide to use Contiki or Motrunner, you can still use the header file and have the same data as all the other students. Okay. So it's you will not have these components, so you have to make up a way of getting the data, but the data is there. Okay. Anyway, again. Send me a question if you have doubts, okay, on how to proceed. Uh, so, requirements. Um, 
implement and test the, the system described in, in, the, in the project proposal in TinyOS or any other operating system, considering only one query node, okay? For example, only query node one. And then repeat the simulation considering two query nodes, okay? So if you consider two query nodes, then depending on the assumptions that you have made on the broadcasting of queries and other protocol aspects, I mean, you, you have to uh, show with your simulation that everything still works, okay? And of course, for example, if you use Tosim or Contiki or Kuja, uh, you can uh, show that your protocol, your system works even if some links are weak. So maybe a node goes out, a, a database node goes out of range with the um, query nodes for a while or there's interference or this kind of stuff. Okay, so you can play a little bit with the parameters as, as we have seen and still uh, be sure that your design is working properly. Any question? No? Okay. <clears throat> so we may end up a little bit early today. It's good, you can start working, right? No. Okay, now, third project is gonna be um, something a little bit more simple, okay? For those of you who want, who do not want to waste a lot of time in getting their hands dirty. And for this reason, since it's, since it's simpler, it's gonna be only up to four points, okay? So meaning that if you do the, the exam perfectly and this project perfectly, you can still get the maximum grade, of course. So what you are uh, required to do is basically implement a system for data collection using TinyOS or again Contiki or Motrunner, what you prefer, Node-RED and ThingSpeak as we have seen, okay? So the idea is to create two different wireless sensor networks, each one with one sync node and two sensor nodes. Uh, these two sensor nodes may be a temperature and humidity uh, sensors, okay? Again, I have provided you with the TinyOS component, which I will now show you, which already provides you with the, the data, okay, for these two sensors. So you can directly use the component if you use TinyOS to get the data or you can use the header files which contains the data if you use another operating system. So let's see the example. It's gonna be here. Yes. So again, you have um, a TOSIM simulation that shows you how to run it, and if you open <coughs> the file here, sensor test C, you have these two interfaces that you can use, temperature read and humidity read, and what this application does, again, very simple, it starts a periodic timer, and every second it reads the two sensors, okay? So, um, and in this case, this example application, whenever you get a reading, it will write on the terminal what is the value that you have read, basically. So you can start from here in order to create two different sensors, one for temperature reading, the other one for humidity reading, and so on and so forth. Of course, you then have to implement radio transmission from the sensor node to the base station, and then transmission from the base station to Node-RED, as we have seen during the lectures, and then from Node-RED to ThingSpeak, as we have seen. So if I run this, uh, <clears throat> yeah you will have a bunch of values, okay? And this should uh, simulate, for example, the temperature that goes up a little bit during the morning and then goes down during night and same for the humidity, okay? 
So you, you, you should see some sort of cyclic behavior for temperature and humidity. Okay? It's not just random data, it's something a little bit more intelligent. And so the idea is to simulate the two um, um, sensor networks. Best thing is to use Kuja, not KUKA as I have seen, well Kuja. Uh, attaching each sync node to a node red socket, okay? So in Kuja you can set up the server socket to each node that you want and each server socket with the, will have a different uh, TCP port number that's not going to be an issue because in node red you can attach as many input blocks as you wish each one with its proper port number so you can create uh, multiple links and then you, has, you have to use Node-RED to transmit the data from Node-RED to ThingSpeak. Okay? So you have two sensor networks, each one is transmitting data and the data is going to Node-RED and from Node-RED to ThingSpeak. On ThingSpeak you should have two channels, one per uh, sensor network and in the channels two fields, one per sensor. Okay. Temperature and humidity. So you have up to 50% for uh, creating the simulation and attaching it to Node-RED, up to 75% to transmit the data to ThingSpeak, and in order to get up to 100%, you need to use Node-RED to read data down from ThingSpeak. Okay? So you have Node-RED, which is putting the data on ThingSpeak and in Node-RED you should you know, create another uh, flow getting the data from Node-RED and for example sending an alert email when the average value of the temperature of the two wireless sensor networks exceed a predefined threshold. Okay? You can set the threshold as, as you wish. Uh, is it clear? Okay. We didn't see this part uh, during the lectures, how to read data from Node-RED to, from, from, let's say, from Node-RED, uh, uh, down from, from ThingSpeak, but it should be very easy. So if you get to put data on ThingSpeak, you should also um, be able to, to get the data back, okay? And then you can, you know, write a very, very simple functions that perform the average of two readings and if this average is greater than a particular threshold then you can um, you can send an alert okay any question about this projects requirements grading so if you have particular question you can come here since we have uh, yeah actually half an hour if not you are free to go, of course. I hope that uh, these tutorials uh, were, um, let's say, interesting to you, okay? Hope that you have learned something. And yeah, that's it basically. So good luck with the projects. <laughs>